I just left his house. We celebrated Christmas last night at the home of, oh, geez, oh, Pete's. Francesca Martin. <laughs> there she is right there, boys. Get she was really right not here. all that uh, outgoing and friendly last night. I mean, if she's not anywhere near your wife, Amanda, uh, she's not in a very good mood. Well, because she doesn't like a lot of people. She likes Amanda. She likes me. She likes Amanda's parents, uh, Pat and Gary, and she likes Kathy Curl, a young woman who, God bless her, comes over and sits in our house when we go away on trips to take care of Millie and our cat, Baby. So there you go. She doesn't like a lot of people. Well, right does, does she like being on uh, streaming television here? She loves this. She loves this. See, see how photogenic she is? She really is. She's adorable. Now I'm going to put you down now. You can't bark anymore. Oh, okay? yeah. Kisses and everything. Doesn't get any better than that. Doesn't get any better than that. There you go. Hey, if That's you're looking right. for a great Christmas present, go out and find a dog. Lots of shelter dogs I out there. SPCA. Wholeheartedly endorse that. Go by the SPCA, and they've got a whole bunch of them. That's exactly right. I mean, there's nothing better than that. Do you guys have dogs, by the way? Casey, Paul, uh, yes, no, thinking about it? Yes, I I did have a dog. Uh, I actually my first dog was named Millie, and we had to return it because it was so wild. Oh, really? Yeah, it was it was a dog. It had some trauma, and it wouldn't go over a threshold. So like, if we took her outside, she'd take like twenty minutes to get back over the door to come back inside. And when she got inside, she'd never want to go outside. So we gave it like three I'll months, and we we couldn't couldn't make it work. That's too bad. I know, yeah. but then I had a then I had another dog for about fifteen years, and that worked out great. Yeah, and I currently have a dog, right now. Her name's Nala. She's a black mutt. Nice. What's her name? Nala. Like the spell that. N a l a. And where does that come from? That name. It's from the Lion King. Lion That's King. where it originated from. Lion the King. Cinemas. You're a big theater guy, Dad. You've probably seen the Lion King down there at the uh, Aronoff. I'm imagining, right? I don't th I think I've missed that. You I don't think I've seen The Lion King. I know Amanda has because she's seen just about every show that's ever been on Broadway going back to the day she was born. <laughs> so I don't I, I, that I'm sure she's seen. I don't think I have it. I would but I would like to see it. I think yeah. it's probably a great show. What is this? It says um, rumor has it. We have one of our viewers, Dad, that says rumor has it. While I was at your house last night, I was trying to teach you how to do the gritty. Have you ever done the gritty, the dance that Jamar Chase does when he scores a touchdown? I have not. <laughs> I have not. And that, that rumor is just what it is, a rumor. And I did not do, I have not tried to do the gritty. Um, I, I don't do it for a number of reasons, the most important of which is nobody does it as good as Jamar Chase does. And he has occasion to do it a lot. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Hey, I, yes. I want to shift gears to um, a couple of things here. Let's start with, with, with the news about um, Carlos Correa. Uh, you know, kind of waiting to find out what the deal is. Apparently, they do a physical on him, the Giants, as every team would do when you're getting right. ready to sign a player, whether it's for $10 or $350 million. Uh, apparently, there was some disagreement about some of the results and what they meant between his agent, Scott Boris, and ownership of the Giants. And I mean, out of nowhere, not going to say out of nowhere, because the Mets were trying to sign him originally. They thought they were going to get him. Then they didn't. Signs with the Giants. And now he's a New York Met. Can you believe what the Mets have done this offseason? There's never been anything like it. Well, we talked about this before. I get tired of talking about it, quite honestly. Um the man spends $800 million. His goal when he bought the damn team was to make it a world championship team. And having, oh, by the way, being the most wealthy man among all owners in Major League Baseball, he has opted to spend almost a billion dollars in one offseason uh, in order to put his club in a position to do just what he wanted to do when he bought the team. Um, you know, like, it's his money. If he wants to spend that money, then God bless him. I, what I'm interested in is knowing what the aftermath of this, for want of a better term, a flip um, from Correa going from the Giants to the New York Mets and what 
will there be any ramifications whatsoever? Now, obviously, uh, I would not imagine Korea had any legal uh, obligation uh, to carry through to the end as far as the Giants are concerned. Maybe he does. I don't know. But as soon as the word came that there was a holdup uh, because of some disagreement among certain facets of his physical, and all of a sudden he crosses the country and signs that incredible contract with the New York Mets, it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of the San Francisco Giant camp now in the aftermath of this sudden change and, and Korea ending up in a, in a Mets uniform. I don't All think right. this thing's over yet. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll, well, I guess we'll wait and see. Uh, you know, Cohen comes, like I said, swooping in, apparently negotiated this deal with your good friend, Scott Boris, uh, while they were in Hawaii, of all places. It's not a bad place yeah. to be hanging out, something you might be doing. but um, Especially come Friday. Yeah, it's a bit, yeah, no kidding. Uh, Casey's already upset. We talked about this before you came on, how he let, lets the weather affect his mood, and he's already sad because it's going to be cold on Friday. Well, I, I, Casey, yeah, Casey, I agree with you 100%, man. Thank you, Mark. It affects my mood also. <laughs> Which means both of you guys are in a pretty horseshit mood in the wintertime. <laughs> <on a daily laughs> basis, right? Yeah. Basically. Well, yeah, when you talk about the weather, it'll put me in that type of mood. You can All count right. on that. All right. Um, I want to talk about Tom Browning. Yeah. You just saw it a couple of days ago. I saw him. you thought Saturday. he looked great, yeah. right? Uh, Tom, when, when Amanda and I went to his wife Debbie's funeral visitation back in March, and he looked as bad as I have ever seen him in the almost 40 years that I've known the man. Uh, he had lost a, a woeful amount of weight. He, uh, his skin coloring was bad. He just looked terrible. And then when I see, and I've seen him a number of times since then, but I've never paid a whole lot of attention because the transformation, for want of a better term, was gradual. So I see him Saturday down at the Reds Hall of Fame. He was there with two of his grandchildren. He looked the epitome of good health. He had put on weight. Uh, he had not put on an overly large amount of weight to, to look obese or semi-obese or whatever the case might be. His color was good. And I told him, he looked so good. I told him, I said, Tom, I cannot ever remember seeing you when you looked as good as you look today. And we talked and we talked about going out to the Reds fantasy camp. He goes, the man and I are going to go this year for the second time. And, and looking forward to that. Um, he just seemed very optimistic and he looked healthy. And then in less than 48 hours, he has left us. And, and it, was, it was really hard for me to accept it. When I found out on Monday, um, I turned down all TV interviews because emotionally I could not do it. Um, I, uh, I, I, have, I don't remember anything affecting me like that in the recent years. And, and uh, to know that he's gone, um, is is sometimes hard for me to accept, and I think that's a reason why I was I was so emotionally caught up in the tragic news that that came out on Monday afternoon about Tom passing. You know, we had uh, both Paul Doherty and Tracy Jones on yesterday, sharing uh, some of their thoughts and memories about Tom Browning. And while no one would ever go as far uh, as to say that that, that anybody could compare with uh, Joe Nuxall, you know, if for no other reason. He born and raised right down the street from where our studios are here, right here in Hamilton, Ohio. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I put Sean Casey and Tom Browning in that next category where if they weren't Joe Nuxall, they weren't all that far behind as far as their popularity with the fans and the way they treated people and the way they carry themselves uh, day in and day out, no matter who you were, no matter what you did. Well, I mean, you just summed it up. Uh, there were so many uh, characteristics that you could parallel one to the other. Uh, and, you know, on top of that, when Tom played, uh, the, he was not any closer to a teammate uh, that he was with Joe. He and Joe were just very, very close. Um, and, and all the attributes that Joe exuded, 
over low the many years that he was so beloved in this town. Tom had many of the same ones. Uh, great storyteller, uh, very approachable, never saw anyone uh, reluctant to approach him because they knew the type of person that he was when it came along with fans. Never heard anybody say anything negative about Tom Browning and uh, by, by any of the baseball fans that, that watched him pitch. And, and the other thing that I think needs to p be pointed out about his popularity, Tom, is that he's not one of these guys that spend his career here. Uh, he and and except for a couple of games with the Kansas City Royals at the end of his career, essentially his entire uh, run a, a, as a Major League Baseball player, with that one minor exception, was spent here in Cincinnati. He didn't leave and go to California or go to Florida or go to some warm weather place and live. He stayed here, and for this town as provincial a town as there is in the United States, that's imp that was important to people. Uh, I think it was important to people without even articulating it. The fact that they knew that Tom Browning lived in Northern Kentucky and that Tom Browning stayed here after he stopped playing baseball and he was out and about and people would see him at Kroger, they would see him at the UDF store, they would see him at the service station, uh, at the drug stores, whatever the case might be, Tom Browning was always around. And, and I think that played a big part in the fact that um, he was one of the most loved players to ever put on a Cincinnati uniform. And I think it's coming uh, to the forefront uh, bigger than ever right now in, in light of his tragic passing. I want to ask you about a couple of the, the moments in his career, both on the field and, and then to some extent off the field. Uh, he obviously was tagged with the nickname Mr. Perfect through the only perfect game in the history of the franchise. You were on the mic that night on a Friday night against the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, Joe Nuxall was still with us back in those days. Um, you know, what do you remember most about that night? Well, I think the most, of the, other than the fact that, you know, he does something that only 22 other pitchers have ever done, um, I, I remember the long rain delay. Uh, and the fact that the game didn't get underway until, I think, 10-15, 10-18, something like that. Um, and then the game took less than uh, two hours uh, because – and also, I think, overlooked in the game was the fact that Tim Belcher was brilliant. I mean, he wasn't perfectly brilliant, but he, he gave up one run. It was a one nothing final score, and the only run that the Reds scored was an unearned run as a result of a throwing error. And I also remember the fact that I don't know that, but there was maybe one ball hit the entire night off Tom that when it left the bat, you instantaneously thought, well, that's got a chance to break it up. Uh, also, the fact that when you speak about perfect games, you know, you, you think about people like Nolan Ryan, who had seven of them. You think about uh, Sandy Koufax. Uh, I, well, Ryan had seven no-hitters. But uh, and 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 uh, and Koufax Randy had Johnson, five. And, I was there for one. Yeah, game Randy. One, you yeah. think about guys that threw ninety-five to hundred miles an hour. Tom Browning, at his best, would maybe throw ninety or ninety-one. But there was never a pitcher any better, uh, including the master of all masters, Greg Maddox, that knew the art of pitching and what it took in order to be successful when you don't have an overpowering pitch to put people away. And he was never better than he was that night. He worked very quickly, which he always did. Um, he he pitched a contact because he knew he wasn't a strikeout pitcher. And it was just a brilliant performance. And, you know, given the fact that he wasn't a power pitcher, ironically, the 27th and final out was he struck out Tracy Woodson swinging on a pitch up and in. Um you know, it, it was a highlight for me. I think any broadcaster that has the right, has the privilege and honor of broadcasting a perfect game realizes that, you know, they don't come along every day. As I said, only 23 pitchers in the history of, of baseball have, have pitched perfect games. And so it, it, was, a, it was a memorable night uh, for everyone there. And I think it, the one thing that we'll never be able to document is the number of people who said, who will say today, just like the number of people uh, and with the passing of years, there are not a whole lot of them still around, but those used to say, you know, I was there when Joe Nuxall uh, 
became the youngest player in the history of baseball when he broke in against the Cardinals at 15 years old. And there are those who say, well, I was there that night when Browning pitched a perfect game. There might have been a lot of people who were there when the game was supposed to start and then left in the two-hour-plus uh, delay before it finally got underway. But the fact of the matter is uh, it was a great night. Uh, I don't know that there was a player on that team that wasn't just out of their mind with with thrills over the fact that, <laughs> excuse me, Tom Browning was a guy uh, that got a perfect game because he was such a popular member of that baseball team. Another moment was when you're broadcasting the World Series in 1990, and you mentioned his wife, Debbie. Uh, and all of a sudden, walk us through what happened that night. Well, you know, that was the night that uh, <clears throat> the Reds came back and tied that game up late. Uh, and what we didn't know until the story came out was that uh, Tom, who was scheduled to pitch game three, which after the off day, the next day was going to resume in Oakland. Um, and Pinella had sent him home uh, or sent him to the hospital when the, when the club got word that De Debbie had left home and gone into labor, was headed to the hospital. Um, Lou Pinella told Tom, go ahead. We're not going to need you tonight because you're pitching game three. And, and so Tom left the ballpark and, and went to the hospital. In the meantime, you know, the Reds came back, tied it up, and the, then the game now, the game is going to go into extra innings. And I think Lou panicked a little bit because then the realization hit him that if this game goes too many innings, I'm going to have no choice but to pitch Tom Browning. So we're in the broadcast booth, Joe and I, and a call comes up, and uh, Dave Armbruster, our engineer, uh, says, hey, we just got a call from the clubhouse. Lou wants you to put out an appeal to get Tom Browning back to the ballpark. Well, I don't know about Debbie going into labor, and, and we're trying to factor all of this information in because the initial thought I had was, this is a phony deal here. Uh, somebody's trying to play a prank on us, and, and then I find out Debbie's been going to the hospital to have the baby, and Tom was allowed to go home. So then we realized it, and I, we put the plea out on, on the air uh, to, for Tom to return to the ballpark as quickly as he could. Uh, I, sometime back, I watched uh, part of that game uh, on a DVD, and it was interesting because Tim McCarver was working the, the World Series, and he, he announced on uh, network television, he said, Marty Brenneman, uh, one of the broadcasters uh, for the Cincinnati Reds, has just sent out this strange plea uh, to get Tom Browning back to the ballpark. He said, we're trying to to find out exactly what the particulars are on this, but we know that that has occurred on the Reds radio network. Well, Tom got the message and uh, immediately turned around and, and started back to the ballpark. And, you know, before he got back, Joe Oliver had the base hit off of uh, Dennis Eckersley that uh, scored Billy Bates from second, and the Reds win that game in extra innings. But it it was one of the most bizarre things that I've ever seen. And uh, it was a nice memory to think back on uh, especially because of the Reds were able to come back and win that game. You know, the, the, the third and final one I want to ask you about that so many people, I, I, we were in here yesterday looking at the picture that was posted, um, a still picture, color photo, uh, of Browning sitting there uh, out on Sheffield on a rooftop uh, during a Reds game. Obviously, he was not pitching in the game. Uh, and it's one of those moments that on so many levels, you are never going to see anything like it again in baseball. I mean, maybe as rare as a guy throwing a perfect game, maybe more rare. The fact that, yes. that he went out there, those rooftops have become so corporate now. Uh, you can't even watch the games barely from half of them anymore. Um do you remember the moment you actually saw him up there and you were thinking what? Well, I didn't see it. Joe saw it. Um, I was doing the play-by-play, -play, so my, my uh, attention was uh, uh, confined basically to what was going on down on the field. And Joe saw him sitting out there and, and, and called my attention to it on the air. And I look up to beyond right field and see him sitting with his legs hanging over the ledge of the, uh, the rooftop. And, and I, I don't know that I was able to uh, accept it in my mind that what I'm looking at is real. 
And then we realized that it was Browning. It, initially, you couldn't really tell, but then when you look after a few seconds, you realize who it is. Um, and I was stunned. I, and I'm sure everybody else was too. And, and then, you know, uh, the Reds players were looking out from, you know, the first base dugouts and visiting dugout at Wrigley Field and were looking out and up into uh, the top of the building and seeing Tom there with a smile on his face, surrounded by, I would assume, Cubs fans. Uh, that was bizarre moment number two uh, as it related to Tom Browning. Uh, you know, Tom's thinking there, the club was not playing well. And, and uh, you know, the Cubs were not a very good ball club back then. And, and, and he, he felt that there was something that needed to be done to shake that team up, to get them to loosen up a little bit. Um, and they did start playing better baseball uh, after that happened. But Davey Johnson was manager of the club, and Davey was not happy at all about it. Uh, I think Tom was fine uh, for it. And uh, uh, Davey was a little bit bent out of shape that he, he thought it was unprofessional. Uh, I don't know that under the circumstances it was that dastardly, if you will, um, but it was a memorable moment, and I'm sure that there were Cub fans and there were uh, those of you sitting in the Chicago Cubs broadcast booth, as you were that day, um, that saw the moment and will never forget it. It was amazing. Yeah. It really was. Uh, it, maybe I haven't asked you, and I, I guess I'll ask you now. I mean, maybe there's something that, that – that's not the rooftop, that's not the perfect game, that's not whatever, that, that for you stands out or that you remember most about Tom Browning. And that could be, you know, uh, uh, something on the field. It could be something that you saw at a, at a Reds fest or with a fan or on the road, whatever it might be. It was on the field, and it epitomized what Tom Browning as a competitor was all about. And that was a day in San Francisco yep. at Candlestick Park when he was pitching and pitching with a lead. And he was batting with a runner at first base. I don't know who it was that opened the inning by reaching. Browning's job was to get him over with a bunt. And he squared around a bunt and fouled the ball off and it hit him right there, right below his lower lip in that little crevice there, I think it was, between the chin and that, that, that area of skin leading up to your lower lip and split him wide open. Time was called. And uh, I don't even remember what year it was, so I, I can't recall who the manager was, but whoever it was came out there and said, we got to get you out of here. And he said, there's no way in hell I'm coming out of this game. Yeah, I got the lead. I am not coming out. A doctor came out of the stands and sewed him up, lying down on the grass behind home plate at Candlestick Park, and the doctor stitched him up, and he went back out into the game and got the win. Yeah, never saw know, anything you, like that before, never will again. You know, it's funny you bring that up, and I, I said this to Tracy Jones yesterday when he remembered that moment. I, had, I, you know, I was doing the Reds games on TV at the time. I think it was 88, but we were not doing that game. And the guy that I heard that story from, and it just goes to show you what the impression you make on guys you play against. Bob Brenly was the catcher for the Giants. And he's right there behind home plate when this happens. Yeah. And, and when the lip is split, the chin split, he's thinking, Brenly was one of the all-time tough guys, as we know. Yeah. Uh, and he's thinking to himself, you have got to be kidding me. This guy's going to stay in the game and stitch him up right here on the field. And not leaving That's the right. game, he said. He said to this day, like you, he says, never seen anything like it. Never. Uh, and and it, like I said, if there needs to be one example of what Tom Browning, the competitor, was all about, that was it. Because I've never heard of anybody having that situation even remotely similar to it. Uh, you automatically uh, operate under the assumption that when something like that happens, you're going out of the game. And they're going to get a relief pitcher in there to continue, not with Browning on the mound. Not happening. Was not happening. Well, before I let you go, uh, your grandson, uh, not Luke Brenneman, uh, but Aiden Shirley, he's out of school today. And he promised yes. me that he was going to be watching the show today. And he is actually in our chat letting everybody know that he is watching you right now. 
Well, he is a very fine young man. Uh, I'm blessed with having great grandchildren. Every one of them I have, I, uh, with great prejudice, I label as great. And, and he's the youngest of them all. Uh, <clears throat> he might be the most articulate of them all. Uh, he's not short on vocabulary at his age. Uh, he makes great grades like Luke Brenneman does. And, uh, and I'm, Ella I'm Brenneman. Very, and Ella Brenneman both. Ella's yeah. a sophomore at TCU, and we don't know where Luke's going to go to college yet, but he's already been accepted at TCU in Indiana. Uh, so he'll have a decision to make. But but Aiden is a very special young man who uh, I, I know is a, is a, the pride of, of James and Ashley, his parents, and uh, he's a great kid, and I know we had, we had a great time with him last night, especially Luke, who loves to take little kids like that and really get them wound up, which he's very good at. Well, I, I think you're also um, uh, find a way to get him wound up because you were you were you were jabbing. <laughs> Tom, can I make one point? Of of course. I mean, this is this is the Marty Brenneman show when you come on. This is about Tom Browning, and I we found this out this morning. The, the Reds have erected a. Hang on, Dad, Dad, Dad. Let me interrupt you. You're getting a phone call. That's down and sign it. The banner will be up between. Dad, Dad, hang on, hang on. Start over again with that because your phone started buzzing and it cut off your microphone. Start this over again. We want to hear this. Yeah, the Reds. The Reds announced that they have erected a banner at the front gate at uh, Great American Ballpark uh, to the uh, tribute to the memory of Tom Browning, and they are inviting fans beginning right now through the holidays, it'll be up until January the 5th, to come down and sign the banner. Uh, Any and all that want to come by at any time beginning now through uh, uh, up until January the 5th, that banner will then be erected uh, in the Reds Hall of Fame and hang for a a good period of time. Uh, It's an opportunity for fans to show what they think uh, they thought about Tom and, and, and honor his memory by signing this banner. So that's up there now. Uh, at the front gate of Great American Ballpark, and there will be people there to help you to sh- if you can't find it to sign that banner and honor Tom's memory. All right, well, Dad, it's uh, it's great seeing you. Uh, a lot of folks on the uh, the chat are chiming in, wishing you a um, a Merry Christmas, you and Amanda and the entire family. So uh, all Thank of you. us say the same, and we'll look forward to catching up with you again next week. All right, Tom. Paul, you and Casey have a great Christmas, man. Well, Casey, it's going to be a bad day, I'm sure, because the weather's not expected to be very good. So let's just have a crummy day on Christmas because it's cloudy. Yeah, I know. That's true. It could be 58 degrees, but if it's cloudy, then he'll be glum. Unfortunately, I will be (laughs) humbugging it up. All right, Dad, I'll talk to you later. See you, Marty. See you, Marty. Okay, Tom. Take care. All right. right. See you.